a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we may participate in that great mission work of advancing your name throughout all the earth. We pray this morning that your spirit would help us in our own way to glorify your name and to bear witness to your matchless love and your wonderful salvation through Christ our Lord. We pray for your blessing on us as we worship and fellowship together. We ask for your blessings on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please remain standing and John will introduce our first hymn. First hymn this morning is <clears throat> hymn number 17. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Number 17.
Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I'm going to read the first few verses of that psalm. The psalm is the longest chapter in the Bible, I think, of 176 verses. I'd like you to memorize it this afternoon. <laughs> Just try it. <laughs> um, it might be good to pick out one or two verses at least <laughs> to memorize them. But we'll look at the first eight verses of the psalm. Uh, it's an interesting psalm. It's arranged alphabetically according to the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, each of the verses that you have before us begin with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. Of course, it doesn't come through in English, but it's a highly structured psalm. And so you see that God's word comes to us not only in prosaic form in, in discourse and argument and narrative and that sort of thing, but also in highly structured poetry. And so it's a, a blessing to, to read that. And for those of you who, who are artistically minded, I think even through the English translation, you can begin to sense uh, some of the beauty of God's word. But here we read, beginning with verse 1 of Psalm 119, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I, will be, I, will, I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Our next reading is from the New Testament Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. We'll see that in our readings we are reflecting on the law of God, which will be topic of our sermon this morning. Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he, that is Jesus, answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all burnt, whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. I'd love to preach on that at some point. Uh, I think the scribe has his own understanding of the law there, uh, but on the surface, what he had to say was uh, quite right. Next, Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, verses 8 through 14. This comes after Paul gives instructions to the church on responding to civil authorities, a topic that is of some interest today in view of things that are happening uh, in our country and, and certainly to the north in Canada. But here he continues by writing, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, 
you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. We'll finish our reading from God's Word here for the moment and look to our catechism reading this morning, uh, which you'll find printed in the bulletin again. We're looking at questions with regard to the nature of prayer. So the catechism questions are numbers 98 and 99. I don't know if I'll get to 99 this morning at this point. Uh, so, but we'll read them together. What is prayer? Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to His will. In the name of Christ, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of His mercy, mercies. Question 99. What rule hath God given for our direction in prayer? Answer. The whole Word of God is of use to direct us in prayer. But the special rule of direction is that form of prayer which Christ taught his disciples, commonly called the Lord's Prayer. I titled this homily, Amazing Prayer, because it just strikes me as an amazing thing, an amazing privilege that we have to enter into the throne room of heaven itself and to make our requests, even our desires, known to God. If you recall in the Old Testament the story of Esther, where uh, the queen of Persia was dismissed by the king, uh, and Esther then was raised to take her place, Esther being a Jewish, young Jewish woman, a refugee. Uh, she was a beautiful woman, and she was chosen by the king to take the place of Queen Vashti. Uh, Esther has a request, however, of the king at one point in time, because Haman uh, wanted to destroy the Jewish people in Persia. And so she wanted to enter into the king's presence and to make a request to have Haman and the king over to her uh, domicile for a, a meal. Well, you could not just simply walk into the king's presence. You had to be uh, invited by him. If you did walk into his presence, you had to have him acknowledge you and welcome you in, otherwise you couldn't even be executed. So he didn't tolerate interruptions. Esther came because she was standing on behalf of her people. And she stood before the king, and the king granted her access to him. She is a picture of Christ, who has come for us and intercedes on our behalf before the Father. We deserve to be executed in terms of our sin, but we have Christ as our mediator, the one who intercedes for us. He enters into the presence of the Heavenly Father and brings our requests for our well-being and salvation to Him. So prayer is that means by which we have access into the very presence of God. The situation is different, however, from that of King Ahasuerus and Esther, uh, we do not come before a king who is moody, who is whimsical, who is arbitrary in his decisions. We come before the God who is the ruler of the heavens and the earth, the creator of all, but also one who has become our Father in Christ Jesus. One who loves us and wants to hear from us. Indeed, invites us to come and to pray and bring our requests to him. 
some of you are fathers and know the joy of having your children come up to you and ask you for something. Maybe it gets to be a burden at times too when they're constantly pestering you for some toy or gift that they want. But uh, you want to know what's on their hearts and you want to be able to help them out and make their life uh, pleasing to them. My brother knew of one of his son's great interest in trains and this Christmas he bought a very special train for him uh, to celebrate uh, Christmas with him. Uh, and it was a great blessing to him. They, I'm sure he enjoyed it very much. Uh, but our Heavenly Father loves to hear from you, to hear from us. And so it's our great delight and privilege to enter into the presence of the King with his favor extended to us because of Christ. And he will then grant us our request according to his will. And so Prayer is a tremendous blessing of the children of God. It is unique to them in the sense that God will hear us. He does not hear the prayer of the wicked until they are praying to repent and seek God's forgiveness. Their prayers can go up into the heavens, but they don't even know whom they are praying to. Remember the people of Athens, when Paul visited there, they had... Uh, Idols to all the different gods of the, the great city-state. Everywhere you go, there was a god on each street corner, kind of like purposely with the different churches and all different kinds of ways of worshiping God. Um, and then they even had one to the unknown god just in case they missed somebody. They didn't want to be, be thought that they were irreverent to that one missing god. So they had to worship there. The pagan goes in the blindness of his mind and reaches out but he doesn't understand who he is approaching in prayer and he certainly doesn't approach the creator in the way that God expects which is only through Jesus Christ and his mediatorial work and so it's the great privilege of God's children to approach him in prayer and we should then make great use of that uh, privilege uh, Again, it's an offering up of our desires unto God. What's on your heart? What's important to you? What do you desire for yourself, for your family, for your church, for your world? Pray to God about that. Don't think that you're being selfish in that. Just pray. Let God be the one to decide uh, whether he will answer that or not. God is good and gracious to us, and he'll answer according to his will. And so... Uh, the Catechism does remind us that we should pray for things that are agreeable to His will. Uh, so we're going to talk about God's will here in a moment, uh, in, as expressed in the Ten Commandments, but all of Scripture reveals the will of God for us, and it counsels us to pursue after righteousness and holiness, to seek the glory of God, to seek His kingdom and righteousness and all things. And so those are the things that should occupy us in prayer. But we are to pray as we'll here in the weeks to come, give us this day our daily bread. So we pray for our personal needs to be met. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins, for grace and strength to overcome temptation, and so forth. So pray according to the will of God, and He will hear and answer. Pray in the name of Christ. He is our mediator. We have no standing before God apart from Christ. Because he is our great high priest. Because he has borne us as the high priest did with the, the, the twelve stones of Israel upon his chest, representing them before uh, God. So Christ bears his elect upon his own heart. And he represents us before the Father. And so therefore we pray on the basis of Christ in his name, recognizing that we want him to be glorified in all that we ask for. Let's magnify the name of Christ our Lord. And then included in that prayer will be the confession of our sins and a thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. So uh, we do, do not come as though we merited God's blessings to us on our own standing. Uh, everything comes to us through Christ. We must confess our sins constantly be confessing them, repenting of them, so that we might enjoy God's favor and fellowship from day to day. And in that way, we'll enjoy his blessings as well. Uh, we'll continue next time to 
talk about prayer. Uh, I think yeah, we have one more Sunday before March, so uh, that'll be next week. God will. Let's pray then and bring our request to the Lord through Christ our Savior. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this expression of your wonderful love and care for us, that you are willing to hear our requests. You indeed invite us to make uh, our desires known to you. We do acknowledge that sometimes our desires go in different places, wrong places, and we must confess to you our sins, and we pray that you would forgive us for these things. But we pray too, O Lord, that those desires that you've placed within us by your Spirit, those desires for holiness, for righteousness, for truth, for love, for joy and peace, for blessing to others around us, for success in our endeavors, uh, Lord, we pray that you would bless these things and hear them according to your will. We pray that you would bless the ministry of your word in this place, that we would abound in good works, glorifying our Savior, that the name of Christ would be uplifted by us. And we pray, Lord, that as others see us and know of us, they will see that here is one who has been with Christ, uh, that we have known him and have been shaped in his image. And so we pray for your continuing work in our hearts and minds, sanctifying us, purifying us from evil, and enabling us to walk after you and your will. Father, we do lift up before you our needs this day. We thank you for your provision for us, for our homes and our uh, places of employment, for our church, and for the community in which we live. We thank you for your goodness and kindness to us, and pray that you would minister to those who are unable to attend services uh, due to age and infirmity or uh, due to uh, sickness, uh, due to uh, extreme distance, Lord, we do pray that you would be pleased to minister to each one and encourage them from your word. We pray that you would preserve the health of your people and sustain them, especially those who are elderly and aging. We pray, Lord, for your care for them. And so we pray for Eve Thomas and for George McLaren, for Rhoda Emanuel, we pray for um, Kathy Martin and for others who are aging and uh, suffering the weaknesses of the body. We pray that your hand of healing and blessing would be on them. Be with Rick and Lois as well. We thank you for them and pray for your blessing on them. Pray that you would be with Rick as he uh, ministers your word to our sister congregation in Wilmington, Delaware. We pray, Lord, that you, your spirit would help him, strengthen him, equip him in what he has to say. May he have fluency of speech, clarity of mind, and the power and unction of your spirit. We pray, Lord, that your word would be a comfort and a help to the congregation there, especially at this moment as they are mindful of their pastor's grief. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, watch over the whole congregation. We do pray for David and Catherine, that you would comfort their hearts in their time of loss. We thank you, O Lord, for the gift of children and life, the joy that they bring into a household, but how grieved we are when at such an early stage of life they are taken away from us. We do pray that you would have mercy on them, that you would sustain them by your grace as their hopes have been dashed, as their uh, desires have been put aside for the time being. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort their hearts. Let them know of your great love, your electing love, Help them to know that you uh, will restore and uh, refresh them. And we do pray that you would comfort them. We thank you for the joy and hope of the resurrection. We thank you that uh, even uh, infants are not beyond your ability to save. We do confess that elect infants dying in infancy are saved by your grace and mercy. We thank you for our union with Christ and for the covenant that extends to us and to our children. And so, Lord, we pray for your comfort to be with David and Catherine. Uh, comfort them and their, their boys as well. And we pray for your blessing on them. Father, I pray that you would be with Katya in Ukraine. Thank you for your love and care for her and for her parents. Uh, we do pray that as it seems that war is on the horizon between Russia and Ukraine, and both Katya and her parents are right in uh, potential areas of conflict. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over them, that you would shelter them in your love, 
We pray, Lord, that you would preserve them from harm, and if possible, give them a way of escape. Pray, Lord, that you would provide an opportunity for Katya to come here. We pray that uh, the senator and his staff would uh, be uh, gracious and helpful in providing a way for her to leave. And we pray, Lord, for your protection on her and her family. Pray for her parents that you put them in a safe place and provide for them as well. Father, we thank you for your love and care for your church. We thank you for uh, John and his family. We pray for his mother, Grace, that as she struggles to breathe, uh, that your hand of uh, comfort and help would be with her. We pray, Lord, that you would give her freedom to breathe. Uh, if in some way, we pray that you would restore her, her lungs to an extent that she would be, be relieved. We pray that the oxygen uh, that she receives would be helpful to her. And we pray that you would watch over her. We thank you for Esther and for her care for uh, Grace and for her uh, grandchildren as well today. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen Esther for this. We thank you for her love for her family and for her labors on their behalf. And we do pray that you would comfort and encourage her. Bless the children that are there. May they be a joy to Grace, to Grace and to Esther. And we pray that you watch over their parents, Rebecca and Kevin, uh, while they're away. Father, we thank you for um, your, your love and kindness to us. I pray that you would watch over each of us in our various forms of employment. Uh, we pray for your blessing on our endeavors. And Lord, we pray for your blessing on the ministry of your word this morning. Teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. John will introduce you next time.
well-known passage of Scripture, Exodus chapter 20. There are different points of view with regard to this chapter that we will get to consider a little bit today. But uh, we'll take a look at the Ten Commandments, beginning with the first verse and read through verse 17. We read, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, or serve them. For the, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for uh, the instruction that it provides us in your will. We thank you that your word is perfect and pure, and we do pray that your spirit would bless our meditation on this word today, that you would enable us to live by faith, trusting in your word. We pray, Lord, that you would sanctify us by your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When I went to uh, college, I majored in English literature and spent a good deal of time at the beginning of my studies with introductory studies into the various uh, forms of literature, uh, British literature, English literature in particular, with some uh, samples of other kinds of literature as well. As my education progressed, we began to focus more on specific periods of time, the Victorian era, the modern poetry period, and so forth even on individual writers like Shakespeare, Milton, Alexander Pope, and so forth. Uh, I remember taking a course in Shakespeare. I think everyone who studies English literature needs to study Shakespeare. And the, we had a, a volume that had all of his tragedies, his comedies, his histories, all in one place. And each, uh, well first, the, the whole set of uh, dramas and plays and sonnets at the end uh, all of these were introduced by about four or five different writers who talked about the body of Shakespeare's work. And so they talked about the life of Shakespeare, what we know of it, what we don't know of it, um, his style of writing and uh, the, the history in which he was writing and all these kinds of things. That kind of sets the stage for the whole corpus of Shakespeare's works. And then with each individual drama, each individual play, there would be a writer who introduces us to what's going on in the play. Um, some of my favorite writers in that regard are Alfred Harbage from Harvard, and then also Northrop Fry from the University of Toronto. 
they give really helpful insights into the times in which the play was written. For example, in histories, it's important to know what was actually going on at the time, and then you can compare it with Shakespeare's art, how he compresses things, uh, elevates certain themes, and so forth. And so those introductions were helpful for understanding the play itself. And then when you went on to read the play, you could kind of put things into context. I always found, whether it was with Shakespeare or with other writers of poetry, that it was helpful for me to know about the author. What was his background? What were his beliefs? What was he trying to achieve in his poetry or in his stories, short stories or novels? His, what is his worldview? Inevitably, his worldview shapes the nature of his art. And so that was always very helpful to me. When I went off to seminary, I had a very similar method of study. Early in my seminary career, we had introductory studies, introduction to the Old Testament, introductions to the New Testament, and then introductions to uh, the Gospels and Paul, uh, introductions to the prophets of the Old Testament, uh, the Pentateuch, and these kinds of things, and then more specific studies on particular topics of interest. Again, introductions. If you were to go into my library and pull out some of the books, I have some thick books that are in introductions to the Old Testament or to the New Testament. They take each book and they tell you the, who the author was. There could be a dispute as to who the author was. Uh, when did he write? What was his theme? What was he trying to achieve? How was the book structured and organized? So that you could appreciate the Old Testament law book, the, the psalm, the prophecy, uh, the New Testament Gospel, what have you, for its uniqueness and its contribution to our understanding of God's work in history and time. Introductions are helpful. They set the stage for what comes thereafter. We've had something of an introduction to these Ten Commandments already in the way that God revealed Himself at Mount Sinai. He sets the stage for His revelation by the majesty of His person coming down upon Mount Sinai. You have the cloud, the fire, the lightning, the, the earth shaking, the sound of the loud trumpet, all of these things informing us that the one who comes to us is the Creator. He is God Himself. Only God can do these kinds of things. There is a separation between God and His people. God at the top of the mountain, Israel down at the foot of the, the base of the mountain, and nobody permitted to touch the mountain except those whom God allowed, and that would be Moses himself, and then Aaron, his brother, alongside him later on. And so this set the stage for the revelation of the Ten Commandments. They give us some sort of insight into the commandments themselves. Majesty, all the reverence that we should have for them, uh, the distinction between righteousness and sin, uh, as given in the law, as the distinction between God and his sinful people and the distance between them. God shapes the narrative by setting the stage for us so that when we come to the Ten Commandments, we are prepared for what we are about to read. This is not the words of Moses. This is not the instructions of Aaron. Uh, this is not the wisdom of the ages. This is God himself speaking authoritatively to those whom he, whom he has gathered before him there at Mount Sinai. And so when we come to this first verse of the 20th chapter, we read that God spoke all these words. He did not use Moses as a mediator to communicate these words. He didn't reveal himself to Moses in dreams and visions or inspire him to write certain things down. God himself spoke from heaven. They heard his voice as he spoke. This came from the very lips of God. And so there could be no question of the source, the origin, the authorship of this law. It's from God. Can you imagine standing on the foot of that mountain and hearing the voice of God from heaven saying, you shall not have any other gods besides me. And 
onto the commandments. In fact, you can judge the people's reaction after at the commandments are given in the 20th chapter when they say, Moses, you go up and talk to the Lord. We don't want to hear that anymore. They were terrified by what they heard. God himself spoke these words. So that lends the authority of God behind the words. And God being all-knowing and understanding who we are, he speaks those words which are just and true and righteous all together. We will find that not only does God speak the word verbally in the hearing of the people, he also writes it down with his very finger. God gives Moses two tablets of stone on which he himself has engraved ten words, the, the Ten Commandments. When we think of that, sometimes we think of the two tables of the law, the first table of the law, referring to our duties to God, to love God by worshiping Him alone, worshiping Him in the way that He prescribes, not taking His name lightly, but reverently in worship, honoring the Lord's day. These are things that we do in our service to God. And so we think, well, that might have been the first tablet of the law. And then the second tablet of the law is all our duties to our neighbor. Honor your father and your mother. Do not murder, do not adultery, do not steal, do not lie, do not, and so forth. And so you have these two tables of law, but more than likely, what you have is two copies of the same thing. Two tablets with all Ten Commandments written on each of them, filling the tablet both sides. No room for anything else. This is all that God has to say about our moral duty before Him. It's given on two tablets so that, according to the customs of the day, when you would have a, a treaty made between two countries, the new sovereign would come in and he would write the laws and expectations that he had upon his servant people, he would have one copy for his records, and one copy would deposit, be deposited with the people themselves so that they could know what their agreements were, or what the stipulations were of their uh, sovereign. And so, following that kind of pattern, God gives these two tablets to Moses. Later on, we'll read how Israel was sitting down in the valley and Moses comes down with the tablets and breaks the two tablets. What are you doing? Uh, but uh, he will then write them again and, and keep them as a record. And they will be deposited in the Ark of the Covenant to be with Israel throughout their days. In these ways, we, are, we learn the following. One, first of all, God is certainly the author of that law. So it's not human opinion. It's not speculation, or it's not the advice of uh, uh, the gossip column, columnist there in Israel. It's God himself speaking. Now, if I can pause for a moment and reflect on that, that reminds us that God himself is a personal God, that he communicates with us, that he's able to communicate in our language in ways that we know and understand, and that we can respond to. <clears throat> So that sets us apart from many in our day that consider God basically as an impersonal force, not able really to communicate verbal truths that can be written down, propositions that you can read, understand, and believe. Uh, we believe that God uh, reveals His Word perfectly in this way, uh, by His own voice, but also in His written record, the Word of God. And just as the tablets of stone were engraved by the finger of God, so also the scriptures are written by God through the agency of human authors. Now their authorship does not pollute those documents. Yes, the human authors were sinful men like you and I. They had their own weaknesses and so forth. But God was able to preserve them such that what they wrote was exactly the Word of God. In our language, Hebrew and Greek, then translated to us, in our way of understanding so that we can know that which God has to say to us. This is a tremendously important point in our day. 
where many churches have gone off into more of a pantheistic worldview. And God is kind of the world spirit who does not communicate in this way. They don't believe that the Bible that you had in front of you or that the Bible that was originally given to the human authors was inspired and inerrant. They think that it was a human document filled with human errors bound by the culture of the time. It's a witness to revelation, a witness to an experience with God, but it's not something that we can know and trust and believe in. And so therefore, we can criticize the Bible. And so all those introductory works to Shakespeare and to books of the Bible come to these books of the Bible and critique them and say, well, there are contradictions here and there and so forth. And that's the modern spirit of our time because they view it as a simply, simply a human document, people bearing witness to an, a religious experience that they had with some divine spirit. So God speaks verbally. He writes it down. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll just once more highlight the uniqueness of this voice of God. You hear it here at Mount Sinai. You hear it once again when Jesus is baptized. Remember, he comes up out of the water and you have a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. In him I am well pleased. And so as Jesus begins his earthly ministry, he has the voice of God acknowledging him as his very own son that portends the intimacy and love of the Father for his son. And then later on, it, you can see this in John chapter 12, the voice of God for Jesus' baptism is given in Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew, or excuse me, John chapter 12, uh, there were Greeks who wanted to hear Jesus. And it was a sign of the changing of the times where the gospel was going to go out to the nations of the world. And Jesus prays that the, the name of the Father would be glorified. And then there's a voice from heaven again where he says, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. And all kinds of people heard that voice. Uh, you might think as well, Paul on the road to Damascus and the appearance of a bright light and the voice of Jesus speaking to him there. These were audible, verbal expressions from God himself in language that those who heard could understand. And so Moses begins by highlighting the fact that God is the author of this psalm, or excuse me, of these commandments. And then God introduces himself to the people. And it's a very brief introduction. You know, if you pick up a book, as I do, I get a bunch of books ordered, and they come to my home, and I've seen some things about them that interested me. I pick up the book, and one of the things that I'll do is look at who the author is and read about his background. Again, how does that shape his book, what he has to say? What credibility does he have on this particular topic? What experience does he have that merits attention to what he has to say? So you want to find out some things like this. Uh, if you go to a, a, a speech somewhere and, and some guest speaker has arrived to address a topic, whether it's at a Christian Bible conference or at a political event or something like that, you want to hear somebody introduce the speaker. Who is this person? What's their background? What's their unique experience? Why are they here to speak to us? And so there's an introduction. And quite often, the introduction can be rather lengthy. Talk about the, the contributions this person made to science or to our, our political freedoms or what have you. Here, God is rather brief in what he says about himself. It's as though you should know who I am. I don't need to say a whole lot about myself. You've already seen me at work in delivering you from Egypt, caring for you through the wilderness. You know something of my revelations long ago to Abraham, your father, and then the great history of my work from times past. And so God comes to his people here and says, I am the Lord your God. 
this sets the stage for why we should listen to him. First of all, because of this person. Who he is. I am. That takes us right back to Exodus 3, where Moses meets God at the burning bush and says, I am that I am. He is Yahweh, the ever-existent one. I am the Lord, your God. He is sovereign over his people. He is one who has come to rule them, as it is his right to do. So God addresses all of mankind in the same way, I am the Lord. I am the one who speaks with sovereign authority about moral conduct. And the laws that he gives here uniquely for Israel at this point are the laws that address all nations and all mankind. Because what we have here in the Ten Commandments is merely a summary of that which God has written on the hearts of everyone. So that wherever you go around the world, there's this basic sense that we have a duty and an obligation to worship God. We may not know who the right God is, we may worship it in, in wrong ways, and all, this, all the rest of it, but we have this sense that there's a duty that we have towards God, our Creator. And then second, we have a sense of a moral obligation to those around us. People just don't get over the fact that you might murder their husband or their child. It's just not, you know, acceptable. There are laws by which we live and operate because God has imprinted that law on our nature. We are made in His image. And so the law that He reveals here is given from the sovereign king who rules over all. But specifically, as He gives this law, He gives it verbally to Israel in such a way that it's a great blessing to them. It's an advance for them. Whereas the nations of the earth don't have this revelation in so many words. They have it written on their hearts, but they're, they're confused about it. They don't always understand it. They suppress that information within them. They disobey it and so forth. For Israel, God reveals explicitly what His law is. What a privilege that is for us to have God tell us what He expects of us so that we can know how we can please Him or how we might offend Him and avoid those kinds of things. This is a tremendous blessing given to us that God reveals His will to us in His Word. And so we should be grateful for that. I am the Lord. I am the Lord, your God. And so this reflects His electing love he has set apart Israel from all the nations of the earth and says that I am the Lord, your God. And I, the God who speaks, who is a personal God, a God of wisdom and knowledge and understanding, I am your God. I am in fellowship, in relationship with you. I am in covenant with you. You are my people. And so God not only asserts his sovereignty, but also his love. His grace, His connection with you and I. The law is not meant to be something to beat us over the head so much as to enhance this relationship. He is our God. If we understand His law, it leads us into fellowship with Him. Uh, we can make this comment then about God's law. If it has to do with our relationship with God, then there is a unity to the law. When we look at the law, we see all kinds of restrictions for the most part. I think there's seven or eight negative statements or forms of the commandments. You shall not do this, you shall not do that. And all prescriptions against what we may not do. But underneath them, there is one motivating factor. The law is actually a call for love. God calls us to, to love Him all that we are and to love our neighbor as ourselves and what the law does is simply explains how that love shows itself and sometimes somebody might say I love you, I love you, I love you but they do strange and goofy things and you wonder well do you really love me or do you just 
appreciate the benefits that you have from a relationship with me. Love is obedience. Love is a connection. And so we read throughout the, the rest of the scriptures, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said. And so the, the law of God is summarized in love. We read that from Romans chapter 13, uh, where Paul tells that love is the fulfillment of the law. And then Jesus said, the two points of the law, love the Lord your God, the Lord of my soul, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And so when we come to this law giving, there's a unity within it. It's a call to love, to love God and respond to Him and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so in these ways, we respond to God. It has a unity also in the fact that it is the law of God, and so it has one author, and there's a harmony to it. And so all these commandments are interrelated. And James will say that if you offend at one point, you've broken them all. Now this gets us into a lot, which we don't have time for this morning. But all these laws are interconnected. You can see right from the very start. You shall have no other gods besides me. Well, if God is your God, then you will worship him in the way that he dictates. You will reverence his name. You will honor the Sabbath. You will honor the people made in his image by taking care of them in the way that he describes in the rest of the commandments. All this is related to the first commandment. If you disobey any of these commandments, you're breaking the first commandment. And it goes all the way through, backwards and forwards. You murder, well then you're sinning against the God who created that person in his own image. Uh, you're offending the person itself. You're breaking faith, adultery, with your neighbor. You're stealing by taking this person's life from them and harming uh, the family that's dependent upon this person, the income they provide and so forth. There are just all kinds of ways in which these commandments are interrelated. It's one harmonious whole. say, in, in that sense, that's why we observe all these commandments and don't kind of shuttle one out of the way like the fourth commandment to uh, keep the Sabbath day holy. It's all a part of this one system. It's one revelation of God's will for us. So he is the Lord your God. He is the one who, is subject, who, who deserves your worship and service. But then he says, that this law is founded upon the fact that I have delivered you from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And so this is very important for our understanding of the law. Many times today when people come to the law, they look at it as a means by which they can please God and earn favor with God. So what does God expect me to do? Well, keep the commandments. Do this, that, and the other, and we're good, right? Well, not so much. The commandments come on the foundation of what God has done for us. He delivered Israel out of Egypt. He redeemed them. He made them his own people. He entered into a covenant with them. They're his. On the basis of that work, then he gives them his commandments and tells them, this is my will for you. So as they obey those commandments, they're not trying to earn God's favor to begin with. They already have his favor. They are already his children. Rather, what you have here is an expression of gratitude for that which God has done for us. Because He has saved us, then we can live for Him and do His will. And that's tremendously liberating. We're not trying to earn our way into heaven as the Roman Catholic will do when it says that God saves us from some of our sins, but then we've got to add to that our good works. And these good works are meritorious and earn our way to heaven. And if we fall short of those good works on ourselves, which he will, <laughs> there is a treasury of merit from saints who have uh, performed superlative works, super derogatory works, that you can access through indulgencies and these kinds of things. That is so messed up in terms of scripture. That is just outrageous. There are no saints that have good works enough to save themselves, let alone have the abundance of an extra to save you. They're all sinners dependent upon Christ alone for their salvation, if they're in heaven, if they are saints. If 
By the way, the church doesn't make them saints. Christ makes them saints by his offering on their behalf. And so attempting to look at the commandments as a way to please God, to earn favor with God, will lead to failure. That brings up one of the points of God's law. It exposes our sin. It shows us that we are helpless, utterly helpless, to earn God's favor. We need mercy. We need grace. We need a Savior who delivers us from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. And so that deliverance from Egypt anticipates God, Christ's work when He delivers us from our sin, from Satan, the kingdom of darkness. He delivers us into the kingdom of light. We need a Savior. And so the law is given on the basis of God's saving work. And so on that ground that we then serve the Lord. I spoke of the Roman Catholic, the same is true of the mainline Protestant. They don't have particularly an appreciation for the atonement of Christ. His cleansing, from, cleansing us from sin through his offering of himself, bearing the wrath of God and justice for our sins. They don't accept that. I remember having a conversation with some folks who attended here some time ago. It came out of a mainline church. And they were about to leave the church here after a while. And I sat down with them and they asked me, the wife, I remember the wife asked me, do you really believe that God punished his son at the cross for us, for our sins? Yes. That's the message of the gospel. The father was pleased to send his son into the world to bear our sins upon himself and to suffer for us. And the son willingly, voluntarily agreed to do that and went to that cross for that very purpose, to suffer. And she said, I can't accept that. There's no way I can do something like that. I would never punish my son for somebody else. I'd never do that. And so she judged God on the basis of her own feelings. What she thought was right, she completely missed the greatness, the glory, the grace of the gospel. That we have such a Savior who willingly, voluntarily gave up himself for us and for our salvation. And so the commandments come to us on the basis of God's work of redemption and salvation in Christ. Well, there's so much more to say in the way of even introduction. I'll have to leave that to you for your further reading. But Lord willing, we'll go through these commands. And because these things are so important and so neglected today, I want to slow down and go through each of these commandments a week, maybe a couple weeks at a time to explain these things and apply them in ways that we don't get to do in our little shorter catechism meditations. We'll get into these things in greater detail. And hopefully God will bless that to sanctify us, to renew us, and to help us see the glory and the beauties of God's Word, His law, and then be able to explain to others what is it that God expects of us? What does God expect of you? And why do you need a seed? And we'll pursue that, Lord willing, next week. Let's pray. Father, we pray for your blessing on our meditation this morning. We thank you for uh, reminding us of your authority and uh, revealing your will. We thank you as well for your uh, love and grace making us uh, your children. We can call upon you as our God, and you have delivered us from uh, our bondage to evil and sin. We do pray that as we consider your word, that your spirit would bless it to our hearts and sanctify us, making us more like our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.
stand and say praise to God.
receive God's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you.